And I'm going to do this presentation again. It's a, a, a little bit about the system I created called Treadside Manor for my um, staff so that they could uh, um, grow, not just help AYC grow, but to help them grow inside and outside of the business. And I've been fortunate not only to have clients that have been with me uh, many clients, probably close to 30 of them for over 30 years. But I've also got some uh, two of my coaches that have been with AYC for 30 years this year. Um, and, you know, I've always when I bring somebody into the fold here at AYC, I tell them this isn't a job that re I really want you to think of this as a lifetime career. And I want to support you and give you all the tools and incentive to want to be here and to stay. So, you know, a lot of times businesses are stopping grounds for their next step. Uh, and But I always wanna give my team uh, everything that it takes to run their own business, but the incentive to wanna stay. And I think uh, Travis does a good job uh, there at Journey with you all in that same regard. So I'm gonna share with you a few stories specific to Treadside Manor. And um, uh, again, the system I developed and then just kind of some experiential knowledge over the course of my four decades plus in the industry. And it's been nothing but a blessing. Now, I'm sure you've heard that saying that those who can do and those who can't teach. You've all heard that saying, right? But we take that one step further and say that those who can't teach, teach P.E., and then for me, I had to take that one step further and say that those who can't teach PE become coaches and personal trainers. And that certainly is me. My name is Greg Justice, and I am a proud personal fitness trainer and coach and have been for now four decades. I own a company called AYC Health and Fitness. AYC stands for At Your Convenience. We are Kansas City's original personal fitness training center. Mm -hmm. uh, we opened in May of 1986. We're in our 38th year here in Kansas City. I am also co-owner of a company called Endless Rope. Some of you will be familiar with what the Endless Rope is. Um, it is the world's original, original scalable rope climbing machine. And I've been part of that company for the last four years. And I have loved every minute of being part of that company. I also co-own Scripter Publishing Group. And many of you are familiar with Scripter. Uh, my business partners are Kelly Watson. Most of you will know Kelly. And you may have heard of this guy named Todd Durkin, who is my other business partner. So we uh, are the three owners of uh, Scripter Publishing Group. It was founded in January of 2017. And... Um, we have now helped over 200 authors become best-selling authors. And again, it has been nothing short of a blessing to be part of all three of these companies. And uh, I am as passionate about one as I am about the other two. And so um, if you ask me which is my favorite, I couldn't give you a, an answer because I love each of them. I've also uh, authored or co-authored more than 25 books, including... Uh, the one you see on the screen there, Pride and Discipline, The Legacy of Jack LaLanne, which I co-authored with Jack's widow, Elaine LaLanne, who is going strong at 97 and a half years of age. We launched the book on her 96th birthday, so it's been out about a year and a half, has been a number one bestseller multiple times uh, uh, over the course of the last 18 months, and earlier this year in April, we were able to announce that Mark Wahlberg's production company is going to do the biography and a feature film on Jack. And uh, this is not for public knowledge yet, but I will share with you all that uh, Mark has agreed to play the role of Jack LaLanne, and he will be a perfect uh, Jack LaLanne. Um, I've also done a series of mindset books, and many of you that are part of the Mastermind Group, in fact, I think all of you all are, uh, will know the importance of mindset and how Todd is always talking about getting your mind right. Um, I've done a book on the psychology of weight loss, the psychology of athletic success um, with a former first round Kansas City Chief um, uh, draft pick, 
uh, and a long time, 40 year friend, Art Still. Uh, and then I also did a book on Mind Your Own Fitness, which is bringing the best of the Eastern world of fitness and Western world of fitness together. Uh, and of course, my signature book, Treadside Manor Confessions of a Serial Personal Trainer, which I just shared with um, Travis this morning in your email, the PDF version of Mind Your Own Fitness, uh, I'm sorry, of um, Treadside Manor for him to share with each of you. So you'll each get a copy of Treadside Manor. So the first lesson, I'm going to share a story with you right out of the uh, right out of the gate um, uh, here in a minute. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about where I got the term treadside manner. It comes from a doctor's bedside manner. And doctors need good bedside manner with their patients, just as you as a coach and trainer need great treadside manner for long-term success. That term came to me uh, when I was standing next to a treadmill in a warm-up session with one of my clients, and we were just talking, and it hit to me, it, it occurred to me, this is just like a doctor conversing with one of his patients bedside. So that's where the term treadside manner came about. And truly, great interactions with your clients mean growth and long-term success for any business. And the first lesson that I learned early on was actually before I started AYC, I was managing a local workout center here in town, and I had my dream job. And uh, many of you are familiar with that TV show, The Apprentice, and what was Donald Trump's famous, famous line in that? Well, uh, I walked into my uh, managerial position at the workout facility one day, and there was a gentleman sitting at my desk. And I thought, well, this can't be good. Uh, and it was the new owners of the facility. The owners that I had worked for had been in the process of selling the gym. And the new owner came in and proceeded to tell me that he was no longer going to keep my employment, but bring his own people in from out of town. And uh, I was a 24-year-old young man that had just gotten married six months before. This was about three weeks before Christmas uh, in 1985. And uh, I can remember just being completely devastated uh, that I had just lost uh, my dream job. And I had to react very quickly. And a lot of times we react in a negative manner when a negative stimulus comes at us. But I can remember vividly thinking, oh, no, how is this going to impact? Obviously, it was going to impact me. But how is this going to impact all of those relationships that I had built at that club over the previous three years? And so I, I stopped in my tracks, kind of got my own self-pity uh, in check. And I, I asked him, I said, how should we make this transition so that it doesn't affect our clients? And I used the term our because I still felt so connected. You know, they were as much mine as they were uh, the new ownership. Uh, I said, how can we make this transition in a very smooth manner? And what was supposed to be about a five-minute conversation turned into a 45-minute transition conversation about how we could transition, you know, my reign at the club with the new ownership and the new management team that he was bringing in. And I think that really set a tone uh, with him, because, you know, it, rather than just firing me and sending me on my way, we developed a pretty quick relationship of respect, mutual respect. And he saw that I didn't, you know, fire back at him after being fired. Um, but I was hurt. I was I was really devastated inside. But again, we spent several minutes laying out the course of action to make sure that this was a smooth transaction or, or transition. Um, I went home for the rest of that day. We only had one car at the time. I'd just been married six months. My wife worked at a publishing company. And I can remember trying to put my story together for my new bride of six months on how I was going to tell her that I just lost my job. So I spent the whole day crafting this story for her of telling her what had happened. And uh, then I drove and picked her up at five o'clock in the evening and was just devastated. I think I was probably even crying. Um, 
a little bit. And then I told her what had happened. And she said, stop right there. It's okay. She said, this is a perfect opportunity for you to go back and complete your graduate work and come back to Kansas City and do what you've always wanted to do and start your own business. And that, I mean, that just stopped me in my tracks because, you know, the woman I love now that I've been, I've been married almost 40 years now. And, you know, to have that support at the lowest time in my life was so critical. And I went home and I slept on it. And the next morning, I woke up and called my graduate professor that I had worked for previously uh, in Kentucky. And I said, I know this is a long shot. I've got one semester left, left to complete my graduate work. I was just calling to see if there was an opportunity uh, or an opening uh, for a graduate assistantship because I didn't have the money to pay for college uh, or a place to stay or food <laughs> at the time. And I just lost my job. And he said, Greg, you're not going to believe this. He said that my graduate assistant just yesterday, the same day I had gotten fired, took another position at the University of Kentucky. He said, that position is yours. I don't even have to put it out on the uh, job board. He said, it's yours if you want it. And so 24 hours after getting fired from the position, you know, my dream job, all of a sudden I had the opportunity to go back, my tuition paid, my room paid, and my food paid to complete my graduate work um, just again overnight. Now, I'm a person of faith, so I, faith, so I don't believe in coincidence. I think that was meant to be. Uh, and I get emotional thinking about it. Because it was a powerful time in my life. Uh, and so now I had everything in line. I was ready three weeks later to head back to Kentucky from Kansas City. I'm here in the Midwest and uh, start my last semester, five months uh, at, in Kentucky to complete my graduate degree and start my own business in personal training. And uh a funny thing happened the next day as I was preparing my move back to, to Kentucky. The guy that fired me, now 48 hours later, called me back and said, Greg, I made a mistake. He said, the, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the clients have come to me on your behalf, and I want you to come back. And all of a sudden, I had a dilemma. Here I had been fired from my dream job. I had gotten the opportunity to complete my graduate work and the opportunity to go back to my dream job. So I had to think fast. And I said, whoa, you know, that, that, that's a shock. You know, it's a surprise. I said, here, let me explain what happened yesterday. I said, I was offered the opportunity to go back and complete my graduate work. It'll take me five months from January to May. I'll come back in May and work for you if you will allow me to start my personal training business in your gym. Now, roll the clock back 40 years, personal training as an industry did not exist. In fact, uh, in the Midwest, I think there were, may have been between Dallas and Denver, maybe one other personal training facility. So it was really something completely out of the ordinary back then. The line got real quiet. And uh, for about probably 15 seconds, there was just total silence. I had said all I could say, and now it was up to him. So he said, you know what, Greg? He said, I'll take you up on that offer, and I'll even take it one step further. I'll become your first client when you come back. So in that time of 48-hour span, a whole lot had occurred in a young man's life. And the lesson that I learned in that 48-hour time span was that bridges are made for crossing, not burning. And had I reacted negatively to that negative situation of being fired, I could have really set myself back a long, long way. Because what happened is I had the opportunity to complete my graduate work. In that time, I built out a five-year business plan, and I had a facility already to start my business. Had I burned that bridge, I can't even imagine how much longer that uh, learning curve and that process would have taken. So lesson number one is bridges are made for crossing and not burning. I came back in May and I had $40 and a new pair of tennis shoes to start this business. But I had my first client 
and I had a brochure because my wife worked at a publishing company. And the gentleman that did this brochure in 1986, actually started it late in 1985, uh, is still a client today. Um, he's one of those 30 plus year, he's almost 38 years. Um, and this is the brochure that I literally walked door to door with selling personal training door to door like a vacuum cleaner salesman. Now, I think if you tried to sell personal training door to door these days, you'd probably get arrested. But again, I didn't have a marketing budget. So I uh, put those new white tennis shoes on that you can see on my feet there. And I went door to door selling personal training. And uh, what a long way we've come because you can see that five visit per week. Um, rate is now less than my single visit rate is uh, here 38 years later. So we've come a long way. And that was a lesson that I learned uh, a long, long time ago. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the system that I created for my coaches and trainers. And it, again, it's called Treadside Manor. So what is Treadside Manor? Well, it is the way you dress and carry yourself the way you act and react to clients and colleagues, how enthusiastic you are about your product, your expertise in exercise science and progression, your supportive motivational guidance, and your willingness to guarantee their success. And that's, that's a hard one for a lot of trainers. But if you've got a program that you believe in, you better be willing to guarantee their success. Now, the first one, let's start with the way you dress and carry yourself. Now, I don't want to insinuate that I have anything against tattoos or tank tops because I don't. And I, I, I want you to look at that image. And then I want you to look at the other image of leaning against a wall and your arms crossed. Body language, first impressions, and nonverbal communications are between 70 and 90% of all communications. Think about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat that statistic. Nonverbal communication is 70 to 90% of all communications. So if on a first impression, someone walks into your gym and you greet them looking like you're ready to, to throw weights around or your arms are crossed and you're kind of looking down or away, what does that tell that person coming into your gym? You've heard the saying that you only get one chance to make a first impression. You know, and I know you all have a kind of a, a uniform code with the shirts. And, and I appreciate that because that's a professional look in a gym setting. So I think it's real important. Again, I don't, I don't have anything against tattoos and I don't have anything against tank tops, but just know the setting that is appropriate for that attire. And also understand the importance of body language in this process. When you're talking to somebody, engage with them, look them in the eye, don't look away. Second, the way you act and react to clients and colleagues. And I'm always reminded of Viktor Frankl, uh, who wrote the, the book, The Ultimate Meaning of Life. He is a Holocaust survivor. And this is truly one of my, if not my favorite quote I've ever uh, used. It goes like this, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. And in those choices lie our growth and our happiness. This goes back to that first story. Had I responded negatively in that space, the stimulus was him firing me. There was a space between him firing me and my response. How I chose to respond certainly changed the trajectory of my career. And it's so important with every choice we make to understand between that action that happens to us, we have that space and the opportunity to choose how we respond. Also, number three, how enthusiastic are you about the product that you're selling? For us, what is that product? Initially, the first product is actually you. I know we're in the fitness business. I know we're selling workouts. 
But truly, the first product is the time you're giving to your client, right? To those people you're coaching. How enthusiastic are you about selling your time to them? So critical that we show that passion and energy and care for those individuals. Now, this next one is very important because we are in an industry where people can literally get a fitness certification with about 30 minutes of action. And that's a scary thought when you think someone can put a shingle on their door and actually they don't even need a certification. So I always appreciate companies that uh, support their employees, their staff, their teams, on their, not just their initial education, but their continuing education. How important is your expertise in exercise science and progression? Too many times, we've got a bunch of trainers that come in and start saying they like to think outside the box with their training. The problem with that is when they think outside the box, a lot of times what they have not done is learn what's inside the box. Learn those fundamentals. John Wooden, everyone knows who John Wooden, uh, probably the most famous, best college basketball coach in the history of uh, basketball coaches, like to say, if you spend too much time learning the tricks of the tra trade, you may never learn the actual trade. So again, I appreciate those that take the time to not only do the initial learning of the trade, but also that continuing education. Now, there are a lot of ways to motivate our clients, <laughs> but the uh, boot camp system that was so popular for so many years and uh, trainers going into the military mode of yelling at their uh, clients, it's important to understand that not everybody reacts to that stimulus. Now, if you're a, a, a um, first lieutenant in the Army or Air Force or Marines or Navy, you may have to react to that, but your clients don't always react to that kind of stimulus. So it's important to know the room, know your clients, know your individual classes, because each class, each client in a personal training setting is a different personality, just like kind of each class takes on its own personality. So you need to make sure that your support for each of those groups and motivational guidance is relative to that particular class. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of training uh, companies that don't guarantee their success. But if you are confident in your ability, if you're a confident, if you're confident in your program, you have to be willing to guarantee success for the people that come in there. Now, that's a two-edged sword because the clients have equal responsibility to follow the program and the ones that don't succeed if the program is properly structured have not adhered to the program. But again, be confident enough, confident enough in your programs to guarantee their success 100%. Several years ago, uh, I'm on the um, advisory board of Personal Fitness Professional Magazine, and they asked me to do a, uh, a series of articles on what makes a great coach and trainer. And so I titled it, Just Call Me the Justice of the Peas. And it was a series of peas that made up what makes a great coach and trainer, starting with purpose, passion, persuasion, perseverance, and patience. So I did a series of articles on each of these, starting with purpose. John F. Kennedy once said that efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. Now, purpose and passion are often confused, but it's important to understand the difference. And purpose is kind of like that GPS system at the end, way out here. And Oftentimes, we will get off of that course, right? We're not always going absolute linear uh, toward that purpose. But that GPS always guides us back on the course, even though we may deviate from that course from time to time. Now, again, as a person of faith, as I mentioned earlier, I understand my ultimate purpose. And 
what we want to make sure we don't do is confuse our purpose for our passion. Passion is energy. And one of my mentors, I will share with you that in my career, I have had three mentors that have guided me from the very beginning to the current day that we that I sit right here today. The first one was Jack LaLanne. He was my original mentor in the business. My second mentor was Fred Hatfield. Some of you will know that name. He's also known as Dr. Squat. He was the first person to squat a thousand pounds in competition and um, uh, was a, a man that had great impact on my career. And then third is Todd Durkin. Um, and those three coaches have impacted my uh, career greatly. Uh, Fred Hatfield, in fact, I would encourage you to Google Fred Hatfield talks about passion. And you'll see this um, uh, YouTube video of him, YouTube video of him doing this exact speech right here. It goes like this. Passion is not your need to achieve. Instead, it's a burning desire to exceed all bounds. It's not commitment to excellence. It's utter disdain for anything less. It's not endless hours of practice. It's perfect practice. It's not your ability to cope. It's the total domination of every situation in life. It's not setting unrealistic or vague goals because goals often, uh, all too often prescribe performance limits. It's not doing what it takes to win. It's doing what it takes to exceed the bounds of mere convention. Most of all, it's not the force of skill or muscle. Rather, it's the explosive, often calamitous force of will. Now, if you believe in and practice these things, then for you, winning is neither everything nor the only thing. For you, winning is a foregone conclusion. And in the actual speech on YouTube, he goes into a little more detail in each of those. But it is such a powerful, powerful speech that I asked if I could use that as the introduction to my book, Mind Over Head Chatter. And he was gracious enough to let me put that in as the introduction uh, for one of my books. Next, persuasion. Aesop once said that persuasion is often more effectual than force. What do I mean by persuasion? We are in an industry of manipulation. The marketing is simply stated manipulation-based. At every tabloid stand, you'll see on the papers or the magazines how to get flat, sexy abs. How to shred two dress sizes in a week or two weeks. Lose 30 pounds in 30 days. This is the ultimate workout program, right? Those are manipulation-based marketing themes. It's so much more important to be inspiration-based rather than manipulation-based. Inspire them to change. Don't manipulate them. Persuade them that your workout program is the best because it is and you believe it and they can see that sincerity. Next, in the industry, oftentimes perseverance is over overlooked. We are in an industry where the average trainer maintains their cer certification for one year. I think at the average, I think it's up to 70% of trainers after they get their cer certification don't recertify. Perseverance, a river cuts through rock, not because of its power, but because of its perseverance. Finally, patience. When we're working with clients, a lot of times they don't get what we're telling them the first time. It's so important to make sure that when we're instructing them for the first, fifth, 40th time that we show that grace and that patience that we did that very first time. Now we, you know, it comes to us naturally because we come, a lot of us come from athletic backgrounds and this is just second nature to us. But the, now, the analogy I like to use is that of a financial planner. You know, 
my money, I don't manage. I have a financial planner. Why? Because I'm a trainer and coach. I don't do that for a living. I want somebody, I want an expert to manage my money. Same way with coaches. They're coming to us because they don't do this for a living. They come to you to coach them toward their goals. And we have to have the patience and understanding to know that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship ladder that takes people from prospect status all the way up to raving fan. What do I mean by that? A prospect is somebody that is looking for our service. When they come in and do a trial, I'm sure you all have trial memberships where they come in and can try it for a week or a month, whatever it is, or in a personal training session, maybe they give you or a training company gives you a session or two or three to try it out. They are prospects. When they're willing to exchange money for service, they become a customer. That next step is important because once they have decided, oh, wow, I really like this. I want to become a client. That's when they buy a month, a year, three year, whatever the package program is, they have decided to make the commitment to your program. And then the next leap is singularly probably the most important because usually the supporter level leads to that advocate or raving fan status. And those are the ones that go from just being a client, punching the clock, coming in, doing the workout and leaving to starting to bring you clients or contracts. One of my personal training clients went through this exact relationship ladder and as an advocate or a raving fan actually got me two six-figure corporate contracts because of her advocacy and her role on a board of directors at a university and a large hospital in town. So when those clients start to bring you, you know, not just clients, but contracts for outside uh, operations, boy, they have really become a raving fan. And you've really got to appreciate and understand how we get there. Three steps here. Let's talk about hearing, listening, and purposeful listening. When we walk into the gym in the morning, we hear sounds, right? We can hear weights clanking. We can hear the music in the air, noise on the TV. It is a purposeful act to listen, to take that, stimulus from hearing to listening, right? When we start to paying attention to what we're hearing. The next step to that is not just paying attention, but going that extra mile when we're engaging with our clients. And I talked about body language earlier. Part of that is this relationship ladder. When we engage in conversation with them and we look them in the eye, and we don't cross our arms, and we don't look around the room, but we engage with them. That's going from listening to purposeful listening. And that is what that relationship ladder is. I'm going to give you another lesson here, Psychology 101. People listen to you as their coach and trainer to the extent that they feel you are listening to them. Think about that. They listen to you to the extent they feel that you are listening to them. Another early lesson I learned, remember that gentleman that fired me and became my first client? Well, he owned about a half a dozen businesses here in Kansas City, and um, he was an important gentleman in society, and he let you know that. He had been married three or four times at the time. I don't know what the number is up to now, but he was an, he, he, liked you to know how important he was in the pecking order of society. Mm -hmm. At one point during our training sessions, he stopped right in the middle of the set, looked up at me and said, Greg, you're the only one that tells me what to do that I listen to. And that's because he understood that we had, from the very beginning, we had developed a relationship of mutual respect. He knew that, he, that my goal was to help him achieve his goal. Now, 
how do we develop relationships with people? We have to converse with them, right? We have to talk to them. We have to get to know them. I call them treadmill topics. And there are treadmill topics to embrace as you get to know these people, and then treadmill topics to avoid. Let's start with the ones to embrace. Their work life, where they work, what they do, why they chose their given profession, how long they've been there, and certain businesses and the current projects that they're working on. Psychology tells us that people love to talk about themselves, right? So get to know them. Let them talk about themselves. With their family and home life, get to know their spouses and children, their pets. You know, what makes their family special? When it comes to social and their activity life, get to know their hobbies and projects, what they like to do, individual activities. Ask them about their family, vacations. They love to talk about that. And here's one that we have found real important in our uh, little corner of the world. We're right in the middle of the country. We have three major universities, the University of Kansas, Kansas State University, and the University of Missouri. So if you know the, that particular alma mater, get to know a little bit about those sports type teams of their alma mater because they love to talk about that. And they, they can see that you care when you learn a little bit about it. Now, on the opposite side of that, there are topics to avoid. I can't tell you the number of people, the young trainers that I have counseled that have lost their businesses because of crossing the line of extramarital affairs with clients. There are lines you don't cross. You don't gossip about your clients. Anymore these days, it's becoming so divisive that I'm finding that politics are uh, not the greatest <laughs> way to communicate with your clients. And this one is critical. You never want to bring your personal issues into a coaching or training session. They're there for them. You're there for them. They're not there for you. All right. So what business are we in? Are we in the training or coaching business? Are we life coaches? Are we sexy makers or health producers? I like to tell people that I'm in the business of making dreams come true. What do I mean by that? That sounds kind of uh, far out, right? Kind of sounds out there. What I'm talking about is that when people come to you initially, they're willing to share with you their goals, right? They're going to tell you the goal is to lose a few pounds or to get stronger or whatever. They're much less likely to express their dreams, our jobs as coaches and trainers are to get to know the dreams that we're working toward that are fueling those goals. I'll give you an example. I had a 40-year-old client that came, and on the paper, she wrote down that her goal was to lose 40 pounds. As I started to peel those layers of the onion back, what I learned that it wasn't about the goal. This 40-year-old female who had had three kids and gained 40 pounds over the course of her 20-year marriage, it wasn't about just the pounds. The dream was to have her husband look at her the way he used to when she put on that little red dress and they used to go dancing. The dream was what I was working toward. I was in the business to help her make her dream come true. Another example, I had a 16-year-old kid. He was a sophomore uh, in high school. Came to me and said, my goal is to bulk up. I want to get some muscles on my body. As I peeled the layers of that onion back, I got to know this kid pretty well and learned that he had grown up his whole life being bullied. So the goal was to bulk up. But the dream was for him to never be bullied again. I'm in the business of making that dream come true. So understand the difference between just simple goals. Get to know what those goals are fu fueling and be in the business of making dreams come true. Now, when you start to develop those relationships, what happens? They become a big part of your business, right? And they keep coming back to you. And let's talk about how important, not just important, but impactful those clients become. 
one of my clients came to me. This has been, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago now. And she said to me before a training session, Greg, you make this session so personal, but you always keep it professional. Think about that. Personal and professional. That's what, that's what we do. We have to make it personal to feel like we're engaged with them. They're engaged with us, but we have to know the lines of professionalism that can't be crossed. That was an impactful statement. I can remember after she left, I wrote that down because I knew it was going to become a powerful lesson. Lesson. Now, she made that comment to me just before her 3,168th personal training session to me with me. And currently that number is well over 5,000. That's one client with over 5,000 training sessions. Now, what is the lifetime value of a client like that? And remember, here at AYC, we have 30 of these clients. One client, one client has the impact of over $600,000 of lifetime revenue to my business. And when you compound that by five, 10, 20, in our case, 30 clients, that's a game changer. That's a game changer to a business. That's how important Treadside Manor, that relationship ladder, that's the Im impactful importance of that. Remember, if your clients are happy, they're going to keep coming back. And if they keep coming back, client retention equals cash flow to your business. How do you how do you get to know how your clients feel about your business? You survey them, you ask them. We started doing this about five years into our business, and we started interviewing our long term clients. Back then, it was five years, and we asked them simply three questions. And we did it on paper so we could track everything. What was your motivation for hiring a trainer? Why did you choose us? Why have you stayed so long? The minimum requirement is that they had to be with us for five years at this point. Now, their answers for the first one, we put them in aggregate and then brought the top three for each of these questions into focus because we knew that that's what we wanted to focus on. Their top three reasons for hiring a coach were to get healthy, to gain strength and endurance, and personal attention, treadside manner. Second question, why did you choose us? Personal referral, that's the single most impactful, important one that you can take out of this. Your reputation, they said our reputation in the community was stellar. Or they saw us in a newspaper or TV story, not advertising because we don't advertise. They saw us uh, back in the day, uh, we were the only game in town, basically. We were Kansas City's original training center. So we had all the stations, radio and TV stations doing stories on us. And our clients saw that. And then that's how they came to us. So uh, why did they stay so long? We were easy to get along with. I loved hearing that, that they liked our trainers. well with trainers teaching them not to bring their personal issues into the session because it's about them not us and then finally our willingness and ability to adapt the session to the clients now it's not as easy in a group training session but you can still modify certain movements make sure that you know if they come in struggling uh from an injury or things there are certain things that we can do to adapt for the clients so it's important to understand that marketing is wonderful and it does get you client, got clients, but it's your tread side manner that keeps them and it sells your product, which is you equally as much as it is that workout time after time. Tread side manner is what your clients are telling other people about and it's the reason they love you and keep coming back. It truly is, I believe, even as much, if not more than the actual workout, it's the single most important component of what you offer. Now, as we start to wind down here a little bit, I always like to talk about legacy and ask this question. Does a person who leaves a legacy of change have to be larger than life? And the answer is no. 
the person that leaves a legacy of change in one person's life could be you, it could be me, or it could be that the trainer sitting right next to you. Each of you has the power to change at least one person's life. And it's so much more than simply training them. That power is held in a smile or a nod, sometimes a gentle push, or maybe even a kick in the butt. But each of you has the power to propel at least one person. And that power is held is held in each of us, each of us. It is that ripple effect of changing one person's life that can ripple out throughout that body of water. So as we wrap this up, I want to say thank you guys so much. If you have any questions or any comments or anything, I'd love to hear from you. That is my direct email, aycfit at gmail.com. And uh, I would love to hear your thoughts, your comments. And uh, again, I'm just so grateful that each of you were here today and give me the opportunity to share some of my uh, experiential knowledge over the course of the four plus decades. I've been blessed to be a part of this industry and uh, just thank each of you for carrying on the legacy um, that I got from Jack LaLanne that mm -hmm. he told me to pass on. And I share that with each of you to pass on to the next generation. Uh, thank you so much for spending the time with me.